morning and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Maximizing the Respondent Experience. We're going to wait another five minutes before we start just to let everyone get signed in. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. We want to welcome and thank you guys for joining today's webinar, Maximizing the Respondent Experience. In today's presentation, I'll first introduce and welcome our host, Mike King, Associate Vice President of Research Operations, and Emily Bur Burton, Director of Research. Our agenda for today will include the biggest challenges facing research as of now, data integrity, how to capture in the moment responses, perfecting UI design, and progressive profiling. My name is Lisa Lopez. I'm the content specialist here at Fuel Cycle, and I'm very excited to have you all with us today. Before we start, I have a few housekeeping items. We will have a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. If you have any questions at any time throughout today's presentation, feel free to submit them to either the question or chat box inside the GoToWebinar interface. We will catalog them throughout the presentation and come back to them at the end of the presentation. Also, I wanted to mention, if you haven't joined us before, we have a substantial catalog of case studies, white papers, webinars, and industry resources located at fuelcycle.com under the resource section, which I encourage you all to take a look at when you have the time. Today's webinar should take about 30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll go into a 10-minute Q&A session. So with that, I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Uh, we first will be hearing from Mai King. She has over 10 years of experience in con consumer insights and has been with FuelCycle for over three years as a researcher and as a client success manager. Her background is in both quantitative and qualitative research, having worked at Lieberman Research Worldwide. She has worked in a wide variety of industries, ranging from consumer packaged goods, tech, media, and retail. And then we will be hearing from Emily Burton. She has seven years of experience in market research and a background in experimental psychology. She has worked with communities in a wide variety of industries, including CPG, retail, media, and insurance. Emily oversees the research team, making strategic and providing actionable insights. Prior to working with FuelCycle, Emily worked at Lieberman Research Worldwide, managing both quantitative and quali qualitative studies. So, without further introduction, 
I will be handing this over to Mai, who will be starting out with discussing the biggest challenges facing research. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Mai Kang, AVP of Research Operations, and I'm very excited to share not only the biggest challenge facing research today, but solutions to our pervasive response rate problem. We've all heard a lot about AI and automation's potential in market research, and though there is genuine sentiment that it will transform the research industry, industry overhaul isn't happening immediately. Automation and AI are two forward-thinking topics that we should all be actively thinking about. But before we start worrying about AI and automation, we need to focus on the biggest challenge we are facing right now, and that's the unwilling participant. According to Green Book, looking at all modes of research, the industry has witnessed 85 to 95 percent drops in response rates over the past 15 to 20 years. Response rates are now in the single digits, and even when we do catch someone's attention, it's fleeting at best, as the average adult attention span is now only eight seconds. So we have a finite amount of people with a finite amount of attention to give, so we need to treat these respondents well and maximize our time with them. In addition to our problem of the unwilling participant, data quality is also a rising issue. There are issues, of, issues with professional survey takers, bots, and general survey fatigue by respondents that lower the quality of data. Investing additional time into the design of the survey, as well as data cleaning, is what upholds the integrity of the data. By increasing user experience of the survey, which Emily will be detailing further in this webinar, and creating flags and traps to catch professional survey takers, bots, and autofill apps, we can collect high quality data. Some common ways to catch these survey cheaters include quarantining and reviewing responses that indicate potential low data quality. Uh, the first uh, is speeder. The most serious indicator of poor quality data is speeding. Respondents who proceed through surveys faster than others most likely aren't reading your question carefully. The fastest and the slowest response times should be flagged. Uh, straight lining, uh, pattern responses, uh, these are responses in option grids with all the same answers. Straight lining or answers in a pattern may indicate that data may not represent uh, the respondent's actual opinion. So straight lining and pattern response behaviors are methods used by respondents to complete surveys as quickly as possible. Uh, the second uh, flag for answer quality uh, is gibberish. So any sort of nonsense answers to open-ended questions may indicate that the respondent was keyboard mashing or was just not engaged. Another similar uh, to gibberish is fake answer. Uh, so some fake answer examples are things like email at example.com or uh, the, the lore of ipsum test, anything like that, uh, to any open-ended question may indicate respondent did not provide truthful answers elsewhere in the survey. We also have our one-word answers. So again, similar to gibberish and fake answers, one-word answers and open-end questions may indicate respondent is just speeding through a survey and is not engaged. We can also put in trap or red herring questions. So these are useful questions to filter out responses uh, from our disengaged respondents. You can ask examples, or you can ask uh, respondents to agree or disagree uh, with universally accepted statements like a carrot is a vegetable, uh, or ask respondents to please select green from a following answer set. And the folks that are not engaged uh, will be tracked in your question uh, and you can filter them out accordingly. Uh, we can also have consistency checks. So similar to the trap question, you can use uh, this to filter out responses from disengaged respondents. An example is to ask age at the beginning and ask it at the end of the survey and just double check that uh, they have the exact same age at the beginning and end. Uh, another is uh, checking all of the check boxes. So uh, definitely flag respondents that select all answers to multi-choice questions, particularly for a screener. Uh, this is very prudent as professional survey takers uh, oftentimes select all options to maximize qualifying for their incentive. 
Another is uh, single check boxes. So uh, definitely flagging respondents that select only one answer to a multi-choice question, especially for a screener, uh, as professional survey takers sometimes also only select one so as to not get terminated. Of course, the best way to get quality data are from respondents that have an interest in improving a brand or a company. Community members opt into community not only for rewards, but to give feedback to positively impact a brand, be part of a group of like-minded individuals, uh, get updates on information about the company, the industry, or a product. Uh, as I just mentioned, research done by Green Book indicates that communities uh, offer the best remedy to depletion of quality survey respondents. Communities aid data integrity by cultivating a place where customers will be consistently engaged with the brand. The ongoing member-based community interactions are strongest and response rates hit 40% or higher in comparison to the single-digit averages of the industry. Once a community is in place, making sure that there is careful cultivation of community members, meaning consistent recruitment and cleanup of the existing database is key to maintaining high response rates. Both outside and inside a community, there are several ways to ensure that you can overcome the hurdles of the lack of willing respondents. The first solution is to increase response rates uh, to, is to always think about the respondent or consumer's mindset. Uh, so the respondent's attention is limited and precious. We need to be economical with our words and make sure that our customers truly understand our questions. Here are some questions to ask when evaluating the questions in your survey. Is the question understood? Make sure the wording is clear, well-defined, and not too technical. Simplifying the question often helps user experience understand the question. Even replacing words like purchase to buy can help with user experience. Also, never assume your customers know industry jargon, such as how important is the amount of RAM in your laptop. Uh, number two, can the respondent answer the question? Definitely don't use vague language that can be interpreted differently and make sure respondents have sufficient knowledge to answer the question. Make sure that the respondent can recall the behavior or event. Uh, so exam for example would be a question like, Thinking now about uh, the last year, how many separate occasions did he purchase business casual clothing such as button-down shirts? Uh, this sort of question would be extremely hard for a respondent to recall. Uh, things like asking about recall in the past year uh, for a specific uh, category of clothing is just too specific. The third question is, will respondents answer the question? Make sure the question is not too personal or sensitive. Uh, engage whether the question requires too much time or effort to answer. Also make sure that the questionnaire length is reasonable. Our communities allow for snack size service, surveys conducted over time to develop a more telling start to end consumer story. Uh, this will definitely help out with questionnaire length. Um, and will make these surveys uh, much more digestible uh, and is a lot more of a user-friendly experience. The second solution to increasing response rate is to create an interactive engagement with the consumer. Interactive activities drive consumer engagement. This often means leaving the sterile walls of a focus group facility to experience in the moment consumer interactions or it may be collaborating with the analytics team to employ techniques that effectively use information from partial surveys. Or perhaps it's through our snack size surveys conducted over time to develop a more telling start to end consumer story. A great example of interactive engagement that increases responsiveness is capturing in the moment responses. Our memories tend to be fallible. We often remember the emotional impressions of an event had on us more than the exact details of that event. This makes us more easily manipulated than we would like to believe. 
uh, brands can ask their community members about their experience while they are shopping at a targeted store using a mobile app and geo-targeted survey. This way, we can understand consumers' feedback in real time, also allowing us to engage with event attendees in real time or get firsthand accounts of member experiences shopping at a competitor store and comparing those results against the shopping experience at your own store. We can use this tool to understand what drives foot traffic, what consumers do in store, identify current pain points, and how they can encourage upsell opportunities. Fuel Cycle's mobile app and geo-targeted activities allow brands to invite members to share a video, image, or written post of their shopping experience through a diary study that unlocks when the member's location is verified by the Fuel Cycle mobile app. This interactive activity increases the participation and allows for more rich media feedback, such as video and images from respondents. Brands also have access to additional profiling attributes, enabling them to segment community members via location behavior. And now Emily will be going over additional ways to ensure that you can overcome the hurdles of response rates, including how to increase user experience. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Emily Burton, Director of Research here at Fuel Cycle. As Mai mentioned, I'm going to be going over some strategies for increasing user experience, including progressive profiling and incentivizing. Prioritizing user experience is key to gathering high-quality results within a survey. Ensuring a positive user experience begins with keeping up to date on the latest advances in survey technology. Researchers should Start by making sure that all devices and browsers will be compatible with your survey and have controls in place to ensure a smooth transition if a move between mobile and desktop, for example, is needed for respondents. Similarly, a seamless transition between analysis tools is crucial for maintaining a positive experience for respondents. In one example, uh, at FuelCycle, we route respondents from a survey into a conjoint tool and back to our platform in one unified activity. So from a member's perspective, they've participated in a single project. While we run these cross-tool projects, our platform allows us to connect all of the data in a streamlined manner, making the back-end analysis easy as well. Uh, including these types of interactive and interesting activities and survey questions and different tools can help engage members and lead to increased completion rates and higher rates of ongoing participation. Simple things like including a progress bar and keeping rating scales consistent can go a long way in enhancing user experience during a survey. In many cases, a survey's main purpose needs to be disguised in order to screen for the right respondents or to get unbiased feedback. However, making sure each question is as direct and clear as possible is crucial. A survey should always have a logical flow so the respondent moves through a natural progression of ideas. If a survey is disjointed and chaotic, respondents are much more likely to lose interest and drop off. Unwieldy grids and matrices can impact data quality, as well as double-barreled questions. So keeping the respondent focused on one concept at a time will yield better quality data. As much as possible, avoid unnecessary questions that add time to your survey and excessive repetition, which becomes very boring for respondents and makes it difficult to distinguish questions. A short and simple survey will always be best. Um, questions should also be worded in a neutral tone that does not bias respondents. So as Mai mentioned earlier, knowing your respondent population and using language and terms that your respondents will understand is extremely important. If your survey audience, audience is a general population, you need to avoid technical jargon and uncommon terminology. We all know how important it is to have accurate and up-to-date information from our survey respondents. The need for updated information has to be balanced against overtaxing respondents by asking questions that we can obtain by other means. So to this end, at Fuel Cycle, we utilize progressive profiling. Progressive profiling allows us to maintain the most current profile information on our members based on data gathered from multiple sources. We can map multiple sources into one profile field so that the most relevant answer will always be used in exports, grouping logic, cross tabs, embedded data, and so on. If possible, we would 
strongly recommend making use of pro progressive profiles. This prevents people from filling out a data form just for the sake of filling it out, which depletes the data you're collecting. Read between the lines and take careful consideration of the data that has already been given forth by your respondents. Consider a progressive profile as allowing a master question that can have multiple answer sources. So in a community-based example, let's say you have a profile question for what model of car do you drive, which is a custom profile question currently enabled in the community. Members answer this question during registration, but it's unlikely they will go back and change their response in the community profile six months later when they buy a new car. You can choose to check in with members and ask the same or a similar question as part of a survey. By using progressive profiling, you can map both the custom profile question and the survey question into one profile map. Now, when you pull a member export, the back end will first check to see if the member answered the survey question, which is the first priority source being the most up to date. If so, the profile field will use that response in the member export. If the member did not answer the survey, but answered the original custom profile question, that response will be used in the member export. In this way, we're able to prioritize the most up-to-date information on our members. Progressive profiling opens more options for you to consistently have the most current profile data for your members across multiple sources. We also recommend taking advantage of single sign-ons and social logins to remove barriers for respondents. Single sign-on allows community members or moderators to log in using their company network or website login. Social login allows members or moderators to log into the fuel cycle platform using their existing social media profile information, such as Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, and Twitter. FuelCycle utilizes both single sign-ons and social logins to make participation as seamless as possible for our members. We do not access any information related to members' social media accounts. This is strictly a login tool. Incentives are the quickest way to garner interest in a study. We know that incentivizing respondents for their time is important, and we also know that there are a wide range of op options when it comes to incentives. Your unique respondent population needs to be understood in order to, to incentivize effectively. For one group, a sweepstakes for a gift card may be the best way to elicit responses. For another group, a non-monetary incentive, such as a chance to influence major decision makers, will be the most meaningful value proposition. Making sure you understand the type of rewards that will be most meaningful to your respondent population is key to your project's success. In one of our communities for a car rental client, for instance, we had business travelers participating in a long-term ideation project. The chance to influence key decision makers and eventually have their top ideas implemented led to very high engagement rates. Another effective way to go beyond monetary rewards is to gamify the experience and make it fun. So in our communities, we often run quests, which are made up of a series of activities that allow members to compete with each other and receive recognition for their participation rates. We also know that closing the feedback loop with members can go a very long way in instilling a sense of value to their involvement in research projects. Whenever we're able to tell members how their feedback has been used by the company, we see much higher rates of ongoing participation. So at this point, I'd love to turn it over to questions, if anyone wants to submit anything. Yeah, so thank you so much, Emily and Mai. That was super informative and interesting to hear. Um, and like Emily said, if anyone has any questions out there, please feel free to send them in the chat box. Um, we do have one question that's come in so far. Um, this is from Daniel. And he wants to know, you guys have given a lot of great information on quantitative research design and how to maximize that for respondents. But from your guys' experience, what type of research yields high engagement and participation outside of just survey? And I'll hand this over to Mai to respond to. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, that's a great question. Um, outside of surveys, there are discussions, member forums, live chats, diary studies, uh, to name a few other research activity types. 
we've seen highest engagement among uh, surveys in general, but we also see high participation in discussion boards, especially when the discussion is a topic of particular interest to the community. We've seen the highest participation rates, for example, when discussing the state of the industry among a B2B finance community and the impact of GDPR among a tech community. Live chats also have great engagements uh, as you have members that have taken the time out of their, their day to join a live conversation. It's a great way to probe into respondent opinions uh, for in the moment. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Mai. And just to follow up on that question, um, and this I'll field to Emily, uh, what would you recommend smaller teams who are just testing the waters with qualitative research, research should focus on in terms of recruiting and getting people to participate? I think for teams who are new to qual work, the time commitment can be daunting. So knowing that you can start small, so either a discussion where respondents will organically bring out more conversation topics from each other, and a moderator can go in and probe lightly to go further, or even a live chat with as few as five participants can offer really valuable feedback. Um, so for a team that maybe is spread very thin or doesn't have a lot of time to commit, I would suggest one of those approaches just to get started. It's less daunting than a large-scale qual project such as an ongoing diary study or even a survey with a really large amount of open ends that are going to have to manually hand code, um, a discussion or a live chat could be a great option. All right, awesome. And then we have a question coming in from Jeff. Um, he wants to talk about how in the invite email noted a 70% plus response rate, um, which is referring to the 40% higher engagement rate in community responses. Um, how are we getting there with these tactics, which are most important to hit with the response rate? Which are most important to hit with that response rate? Yeah, um, so in terms of, so which tactics are most important to hit? Oh, okay. Um, so definitely um, making sure uh, that you have a careful cultivation of, our, of the community members um, so doing a lot of consistent recruitment um, is pivotal in making sure that you have very high participation rates. So doing things like pulse recruiting or ongoing recruitment, we have uh, some clients uh, that have um, recruitment links in their receipts so that we have a constant stream of members. Um, that's been one of uh, mm -hmm. the, the most successful yeah, and healthy communities that we've seen. All right. So just like through receipts are typically the way that would you say you uh, recruit? Um, I wouldn't, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can recruit. Um, receipt is definitely one of them. Um, another is just a constant stream of sending out um, emails uh, to a CRM, um, doing win-back campaigns, so um, going back to members that haven't, um, participated in 30 days or so, what we like to reach back out to them. We have what's called invite a friends as well, so our members can invite their friends into a community, um, and we can also do uh, panel recruitment. Okay, awesome. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have for now. Um, if anyone is out there on the fence about whether or not they want to submit a question, now would be the time. But in the meantime, I will send any questions that come in later to our team to answer individually if you do have follow-up questions. Um, so thank you so much to Maya and Emily. This was awesome and great to hear. And we just want to thank everyone for their time. And we will hopefully see you on one of our next webinars.